everybody. Welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Sam Wiest. Sam is a former NCAA Division I athlete, and he's also worked as a collegiate trainer and acupuncturist. He's a graduate of the New England School of Acupuncture and currently runs Blue North Acupuncture in San Jose, Costa Rica. Sam is also an accomplished martial artist who has trained with the likes of Lindsey Wei and Wudong Dallas priest, Zhou Zhuan Yun. Sam, thanks for uh, talking with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bill. Excited sure. to be here. So I guess I should mention really briefly in the interest of full disclosure that uh, Zhou Zhuan Yun is also one of my teachers, but uh, you and you and I haven't met each other prior to this point. So there's uh, this is just our, our first meeting, initial conversation. So I thought I'd let everybody know that uh, up front. Uh, totally, so yeah. Tell tell me a little bit about your life free martial arts. Like, was there anything in your childhood background that uh, was a hint of that, that you would get into this sort of thing as far as uh, traditional Chinese medicine and, and martial arts? Oh, I mean, totally. Um, the first time that I remember encountering Taoist philosophy was, I don't know why it really stuck stuck out to me, but I, I remember when I was, I must have been 11 or 12 at Barnes and Noble, you know, our family would just go to the bookstore some days. My sure. mom was the teacher. So, you know, keep us interested in books. And I remember they had on display the 25th anniversary edition of the Tao Te Ching. Um, and I believe it was by somebody like Jane English's translation or something oh, like I that. See. And they had some, you know, pretty black and white pictures and all that. And, I, you know, as a preteen, I was like, oh, my this is like, this is, this is awesome and mysterious and all that. So I read it and I had no idea what it meant, but that was probably my first uh, experience with Taoism and Taoist philosophy. As far as martial arts, I was always an active kid. I was always running around. Um, you know, I did like a little bit of Taekwondo as a kid, uh, but I didn't really get into martial arts until after college. I got involved more in the traditional Western athletic path, you know, up until college and some years after coaching uh, as well. And it wasn't until I actually like got injured in college that I started to explore a bit more um, some of the ideas behind this. Yeah. Okay. So, well, going to like, let's talk about your um, college sports career. What, what what sort of sports were you involved in in college? Yeah. So I was um, primarily a track and field athlete. So I played basketball in high school and track as well. And when I went to go to college, we lost our basketball coach, and I just switched to solely track by my senior <laughs> year of high school. Man, I just kind of stayed uh, with that. It was a, I'm a pretty tall guy and, you know, I can jump a little bit. So I was a high jumper, a long jumper and, uh, you know, ended up being all conference uh, at Boston University. I actually went to University of Maryland for the first year. And that's kind of like how I ended up first coming across Wudong, first coming across, uh, you know, diving a little deeper into martial arts, especially as like a healing and their healing potential was because I was a, transferring schools leaving maryland i was deciding between basketball and track and i actually fractured my ankle uh -huh. playing basketball and so that was when not only did i literally like the week before that it happened i'd gone with a buddy of mine we had seen you know in theaters you know like kind of just uh geeking out over the karate kid remake okay. with jaden smith and jackie chan okay. so about as cliche as you can get uh <laughs> you know but they had that scene of wudong uh, yeah. in the temple and, you know, like kind of climbing the mountain and they actually filmed, you know, a lot of that on location. And I remember seeing that and I was like, man, I got to look up where this place is, learn that there were some schools there, learn that there was this and that. And, and I had all this time because I couldn't even walk. Like I, I was really like posted up. Um, and so I had some time to explore some, you know, some of the history, some of the movies, some different, uh, different ways of relating this thing to this, this art as a observer. And so I had thought to myself, oh, man, like, I would love to take a trip there. But obviously, I'm, I'm pretty, like, beaten down, broken down at this point. Um, but it always stayed in the back of my mind. And that that was something that I started to look to more. Because that also coincided with the same week that I had acupuncture for the first time on a recommendation. Um, and so the, all these things stayed in the back of my mind as I was still competing in sports and started coaching. Was that there was another way of seeing the human body. Um not entirely alien, you know, we're working with the same structure, but there's a different cultural lens applied to it, um, and a different historical lens. And that really opened my eyes, even though it started as very much like, you know, cliche, perhaps even uh, exotified for Hollywood, if you will. It really opened my eyes to like, there's something else here. I started doing some research. There's, there's some authenticity behind 
the mirage. Um, and so I started to look deeper and that's kind of long and winding path later. It always stayed in the back of my mind. So was there something about your treatment for your injury that you found was lacking? And was that what caused you to sort of try to start looking at Eastern medicine? Yeah. I mean, it was not only that one injury, but that particular injury, first of all, it, uh, they use needles in the opposite arm to treat the opposite leg. And, you know, that was profound and mysterious to me. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, Oh man, you know, as somebody who just tends to, uh, chase after something if I don't understand what it is like I, something about me doesn't like not knowing like I want to feel back the curtain I want to know uh what's going on behind the scenes there um it really worked that would be the second thing uh yeah. it, was, it was mysterious it really worked it changed the way I was walking I was able to like you know I was holding my leg basically in place you know if I didn't have a cast on so that it wasn't like poking the musculature surrounding it and like really bothering it and uh I was feeling good after which yeah. was a huge difference um and then later on i think this is more of like the percolating in the back of my mind sort of situation was you know i started i, I had a bunch of other injuries you know track and field is a very repetitive sport um so there's you know in our terms as acupuncturists there's a lot of t and blood stagnation that yeah. will occur because you're using the same set of muscles in the same range of motion over and over and over and over again and so it's really easy to uh overdo it and get injured uh, especially if there's like a little hiccup in your technique or something like that. So, or your training. Uh, and so I kind of like started to get dissatisfied with some of the answers that I was getting from the physiotherapist, you know, at, at the school that I was at, even though I ended up working with like, I think um, somebody who worked with the U S women's national soccer team. And, you know, there were some really good practitioners arranged, but some really good ones. And, um, uh, but I still wasn't satisfied. They weren't connecting the dots for me. I was like, I know that something's going on and like, I don't have mineral deficiencies. I don't have this. I don't have that, but I'm still getting hurt more than the average person. My movement mechanics are actually, they're pretty decent. Um, and it wasn't like, I, I needed more answers. I was not content. And that's really what, what drove me to doing a lot of research into Chinese medicine on my own, because it was this whole other system where everything is connected. And okay, how does this, how does this whole structure work? How does this mind, body, you know, uh, spirit, emotional mass, like actually manifest itself in time and space. And so that's really, uh, that's really what was intriguing to me. And what was your field of study in college? Did you already have a bent towards medicine, whether it was Western medicine or sports medicine or? Yeah, no, I, I started out as a kinesiology major. Then when I switched schools, uh, I didn't have that option at BU. Um, so I really mainly, I would say my major was definitely track and field for undergraduate. I did psychology because I was also quite interested in how does the mind, you know, manifest itself, uh, whether that's through sport and performance or through other means. And then I stayed on because I was so injured. I was lucky actually to have a fifth year, you know, uh, of school. So I got to do a master's in coaching and physical education. Um, at Boston University. So we have a master's in education and it, the specific focus was uh, coaching movement skills, coaching team sports, uh, coaching groups. So that was, um, that was a really interesting experience as well. So at one point, did you decide that this is what you, that you wanted to do, that you wanted to get into acupuncture at, at professionally? Yeah. So I spent some years, um, you know, teaching high school, coaching college, and then later on coaching uh, some like professional like Olympic contenders. And uh, it was probably must have been about five years or so uh, that I started to realize, okay, like I'd like to get more involved in the therapy side of things. Um, you know, coaching is awesome, but you know, I'm getting to a point where who wins and who loses is a little bit less uh, important to me than the experience of the athletes that I'm working with and how much, how they're able to grow uh, as people. And their health is really a crucial part of that. So that's something that I really wanted to focus on. And so I went back to acupuncture school. Also coincided with uh, changing jobs in another way. So I was like, this is the perfect time. Um, I've been looking for all the certifications, things that I could do to learn about this stuff uh, without taking a deep dive. And I ended up saying, man, if I really want to study this stuff, I got to go back to school. I got to sacrifice these four years um, and really put my head down and work. So I was coaching for half of acupuncture school, but I ended up towards the end really focusing on, you know, apprenticing with uh, some teachers and, um, you know, training with Master Joe and like just focusing on school, treating people and as many people as I could um, in my free time.
What what point did your um, martial arts and your acupuncture intersect? What when did you start training in earnest in martial arts? Was it while you were in acupuncture so I, school? Yeah, I think that's really when the dots started to connect. Um, because I had done you know uh, wudong kung fu with Master Joe. I had uh, taken his shingi classes, and I had taken classes with other you know a couple of the teachers in the Boston area. Um, you know, it wasn't until I left Boston that I realized I'm like, wow, there's some really really good teachers just kind of floating around like a couple train stops away from me um, and how like grateful I was to have that experience really accessible. Um, But it wasn't until acupuncture school that I started to see so many patients that just didn't have positive experiences of movement. They didn't have positive experiences with community. And they were in this state where they were coming in looking for healing. And there was a point where I was just like certain people, I'm like, I don't know like what you're healing for, you know, you, you go back and like your job is stressful. You don't really have positive outlets. You don't have positive relationships, like uh, not to be like depressing or anything, but I was like, this is, there's a reason why Chinese martial arts have survived in multiple facets, you know, beyond just the martial component. Um, And I think a lot of it is, you know, we talk about health, certainly there's specifics and that's part of what I'm doing now. Uh, in my career, I was kind of breaking down some of the specific areas that some of these internal and even external arts, like actually, you know, how they actually engender health and longevity. But, you know, and just in general, the community aspect, the being around people, the like, uh, you know, it was even a family. I would say, too, another reason, you know, as I monologue <laughs> a little too long here, uh, like another reason why I really loved Chinese martial arts was at a time where uh, actually my father passed away. That was like one of my main communities was like, um, you know, the Dallas Gate group. So I was like, okay, like it's uh, I'm just going to kind of dive in. And um, I'm sure not I'm sure I already know that that's not unique, you know, any sort of things that if, you know, like we we find family um, around the people that we're we're working together with. And it's a unique experience that like really brings people together, um, shared hardship, shared set of passions and interests. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. And I think that, you know, that for me, at least that has become uh, over the course of my life, the main reason to keep doing this sort of thing. You know, I I started for different reasons when I was younger, you know, it was more about fighting and self-defense and things like that. But I think um, so would you say that you came to the medicine side of it first and then the martial arts became later as sort of an overall whole? Because I think for a lot of people, it's the other way around. They start out as martial artists and then they get hurt. Cause you're going to get hurt and, and you know, and then you start looking more to the philosophy and the medicine side of it. Yeah. I think I came into it from a different angle. Yeah. Um, to me, like the, the survival instinct was like through sports. That's how I was getting like uh clout and respect and, and right. a sense of identity was like, yeah, like I have this athletic identity. Um, I'm good at this, you know, like it's really valued in my community that I'm good at this. You know, I walk into any store, growing up in Boston and like, you know, three people will ask me how tall I am and if I play basketball, you know, being six, six. So like, you know, it's like everybody expects you to, you kind of, um, and it's a way of earning respect, whether that's through fighting itself or through something else. I think it's, it's a little deeper than just the physical defense. There's also the, um, yeah, the like self-respect, self-confidence sense of identity of like, this is who I am. I can protect the space around me. Um, and hold that down so no I was I was interested in the health aspect I went to um I learned uh like a general variety of martial arts uh from a teacher in Boston before I started to dive deeper and kind of understand that there was something to this whole internal aspect and then from there I went to Taiji first because that to me was like I you know everything else like okay there's an external structure then you go internal Taiji to me felt like the quickest route to understanding this kind of mysterious something that <laughs> Chinese internal yeah. martial arts have and yeah. so I was that was the first one and then I actually branched out more into like Xing Yi Bagua and, and the Kung Fu uh, side of things as I've as I've been around it more and, and I'm grateful that I'm still you know young enough that you know some people that find the internal stuff for health may be in a different stage of life whereas I'm like I can still you know train as if I'm a teenager in, in certain ways yeah, that's awesome. That's that's again, you know, almost the opposite of of my my path as I came in via the harder stuff and just now finding Tai Chi resistant to it still, you know, because it's uh, <laughs> but I, I I see the in what, in what way resistant? Yeah, oh, you know, it's resistant. just like when you when you're younger, you know, you you don't want to move slowly, you don't want to pay attention to these details. It's just more impatience than anything else. But uh, I I imagine that your your attitude 
really had a lot to do with how quickly you made. And of course, you had a sports background, but I would say that your attitude probably had a lot to do with how successful you were uh, with with your martial arts, because you, you were looking at it from a proper place. You, you, were, you were looking at it from a place of like healing and building and, you know, establishing a good foundation. So that's really interesting to hear. Yeah, no, it's the, that's the external foundation. That's really helpful. I think I, I still suffer with the same thing that everybody else suffers with, with some of these arts where there's, you know, details. There's a constant humbling, especially, <laughs> you know, like external martial arts, you're humbling. It's like you get thrown on the ground, right? you know, yeah. and okay, you get beat up. Internal martial arts, it's like, there's, it's just so easy to delude yourself yes. into thinking you're really letting go and you're not. Yeah. And to thinking that you are, you know, doing this movement correctly and like there's whole other layers that you just haven't even, okay, haven't even gotten to yet. Am yeah. I am I really, have I really arrived in my internal martial arts practice? Like certainly compared to before, yes. And in the grand scheme of things, it's, you know, I look at some of these folks who have spent their whole lives in the arts and, and I, I still think I have a lot to, to live up to um, and a lot to be inspired by. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a never ending path, and it's a good thing that it is too. You know, gives us something to continually strive for. Mm, totally. So you you're kind of trying to, um, as far as your uh, healing practice, what do you see? What, what just just focusing on sports medicine? What do you think the advantage of TCM and sports medicine is compared to, uh, say, traditional Western medicine? Yeah, so they both have advantages and disadvantages. I would say. Western uh, sports medicine is, is really, really strong for like certain aspects because the performance pressure of sport um, yeah. forces you to be really on your A game as far as things like return to play, um, where certain people in the field are really uh, doing a strong job. Whereas I think traditional Chinese medicine is so helpful, first of all, because of the history. So they, they have remedy, you know, you have remedies and ideas around everything under the sun because it's been used in warfare. Right. It's been used in like, you know, more acrobatic wushu type thing. It's been used for everything, you know, the whole gambit. Um, right. It's been used for like everybody who's getting beat up, you know, farming all day. It's been used for folks who are inside too much studying all day. And it right. has different language to talk about this range of human experience, no matter who you are. And I think it's the language and lens of Chinese medicine that it's, it's definitely its biggest strong suit. Like, I can't pull stuff out. You get asked all the time as an acupuncturist, what point is good for this? What herb is good for that? And it's like, you can't pull things out. It's like the diagnosis and the ability to view it from this uh, lens of yin, yang, and five elements. Uh, and, you know, other th theories as well, because China is a large country with a long history. Uh, it's just so helpful in describing the phenomena that exists around us. And because we have that, we can see something new. And we can understand it. Whereas I think Western medicine is like everything we need to describe. We need to see the detail. We need to like see it, measure it. And if we don't know what to measure and what to look for, then we're kind of lost. Whereas Chinese medicine looks at these like commonalities that run again, the, the range of people, a range of body types, a range of activity levels and a range of healthy to completely sick. Yeah. And that range really gives us a lot of flexibility with how we start to describe an injury or disease. How in depth do you go with the people that you treat about the philosophy that uh, underlies your, your actual treatments? Um, you know, um, one major frustration to me, because I am like, that's where I came to before I was an acupuncturist, was a teacher and a coach. So my goal was never like, hey, just, just memorize this. It's like, hey, I want you to understand the underpinnings behind your health. I want you to understand why we're doing every little drill, you right. know, um, and so that was a major frustration was like, hey, I don't have enough time in the day to really tell that to every patient. You know, like I just don't like to run a successful business to, you know, like I couldn't do justice. So that's really what I've been trying to do recently is, is put together some online resources and programming so that, um, you know, so that we meet in the middle for two different groups. One is acupuncturists who want to understand movement because there's a huge gap in most schools education it really depends on who's working there if you yeah. might you might have a master in qigong or martial arts who is helpful for the folks who are interested in understanding movement from this different cultural perspective and different medicinal perspective but in a lot of cases it gets glossed over just like phys ed gets dropped from schools first um in the hierarchy of today in chinese medicine herbs are at the top because they're super cerebral 
then the hands-on acupuncture and body work, you know, it's acupuncture, then body work. And then, you know, at the bottom, it's like movement and daily living. And actually, if you look at the foundation for health, it's really the opposite. Yeah. It's like your daily habits. It's it's how you move. It's how you eat. It's it's your life rhythm itself. You know, looking at the five elements as movements instead of just static elements like some other, you know, some people might presuppose. Like, no, these and you do singing, so you know. It's like these are these are movements, and if we don't understand them as movements, they don't make any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that that matches our life rhythm. So that's that's a way to kind of like start to talk about these things with folks is that you can take that philosophy and apply it to anything yeah, i think that's understand a, how to be in balance yeah i think it's a major frustration of a lot of medical professionals uh, western medicine too is that uh, you can treat something but if the patient doesn't uh, alter their underlying behaviors or movement patterns or eating patterns or lifestyle patterns or whatever it is ultimately the the treatment is not going to last you know mm-hmm. so it's a uh, i think it's it's a struggle for everybody to try to educate people and what it is that you're trying to set right and how that they can keep it moving. Right. Totally. And there's a, there's a variety of opinions on, you know, even do we, do we do that as medicinal professionals? You know, I've worked with some uh, specifically within Japanese acupuncture. I've worked with some folks who that was part of like literally explicitly, we do not get into lifestyle. We, We just treat what we see. We do not go there. It's like we're not dealing with that person's life, karma, anything. That's that's it. That's our boundary. And I've had, you know, also worked with folks who, you know, strictly, we want to treat the person as little as possible. If we can get them to come out of here and they hear what they need to hear and they change their life and they're inspired, that's it. We don't even need to give medicine. So it's a huge spectrum, I think, but even within our medicine, as far as what people, I think people would assume, okay, we want everyone to know everything. Um but I'm not sure that's always the case. And I'm not sure. And there's certain times when that's not actually um, as helpful as, as you would think. Some people come in and they want to know everything intellectually, but mm. they, that doesn't make them change. That's not yeah. the science of, of change. Yeah, that, that's a problem, too, is, you know, people want to uh, read a book and then they read the book and they say, OK, I've got it rather than actually doing the thing that the book is talking about. So and that's why I like teaching through movement, because I feel like you have to do the thing. You have to feel it in your body. You know, yeah. like if you really understand, you know, five elements and we'll use Shingy as an example, like you understand like where these elements show up in different parts of, you know, the torso, even yeah. the meridian system a little bit. And and you can see these ideas in motion and you, you've done them. So you feel them and you have a, a way to incorporate them into your life. Whereas if you kind of just have the philosophy and, you know, I see this all the time with folks who are just like talking heads on social media, um, it's, you know, the, the fitness industry is like, oh, Eastern medicine, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, oh, man, like, it's just completely watered down and intellectualized. And there's no real depth of, of perception to it. Yeah, there's a ton of that out there. It's, it's unfortunate. You, you mentioned Japanese acupuncture. You apprenticed with a Japanese acupuncturist. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kuwahara Sensei, uh, right outside of Boston. Um, I over like on and off based on our schedules over the course of, you know, about a year or so. Um, and so I just kind of followed him. From, you know, the morning routine was you wake up, you go and chant at five in the morning. It's a com- his, you know, book of chanting uh, kind of like comprised of multiple different sources. But it was this like Shinto five element, um, you know, sort of sound vibration uh, mm-hmm. chant. And then there was some Zen Buddhism in there. It was kind of an amalgamation of, in some senses, like Japanese cultural um, mm-hmm. spirituality it ran a little bit of a gambit. Not to say a full gambit, but a little bit of a gambit. We would go and do um, the Aido, yeah, which is uh, you know Japanese sword drawing art, sword. and then Aikido, yeah, yeah, yeah especially drawing the sword. Um, so it's it's you know much more focused on kind of the Zen, uh, the Zen aspect of it in, in many ways, and body posture and alignment than it is about um, like actual fighting with the sword. Right. You yeah. Know? Um, so I found that routine to be really, and then we'd go to the clinic, and our day would start at nine, you know, until whenever. Uh, so fascinating yeah. was that the was the uh the attitude behind it the main difference between what you'd learned before as far as acupuncture goes or was it a, a, a different modality of, of of treatment yeah it was a different style so it was a style um you know he called it a hari acupuncture and that's from toyahari uh he kind of branched off and split with a it's a major group of uh meridian meridian style acupuncture um from japan it's 
he's basically from this tradition of traditionally blind practitioners. Yeah. So it's really heavily palpation based. It's yeah. really heavy on, okay, where do you feel things? You know, for example, his teacher was a World War II veteran. He was somebody who opposed the war. So they sent him to the front lines. He mm -hmm. lost his, his sight and most of his hearing. Um, and so he would walk in the room and diagnose with very few tools. So a big part of this teacher's um, teaching, Wahada Sensei, was to be able to uh, like get your senses so attuned that you can start to feel things, not only like within the body, but also off the body and using your own intuition in a very systematic way, I would say, as opposed to some other, you know, um, folks when they hear energy healing feels like kind of woo woo and like, right. well, it was he had a system. Like there was, it was not rigid, but it was like step by step. This is how you intuit if you, you know? Um, and so it was really interesting to see that in, in practice um, and to feel that like being in the room with him uh, for treatments and also just, you know, the Japanese method is very much like it's strict. Like you, you watch, you do, um, you're quick, you know, everything's mindful, but this man, if, you know, if you turn your head for a second, he's gone. Like yeah. he's treating like three people at once in different rooms. Like I, I, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm on a different, you know, kind of like level, eye level. If I look at the wall for a second, I'm in the room, you know, by myself. Wow. Like he is fast, you know. Um, yeah. Did that have a major uh, influence on the way that you treat people? Your yeah, interest? yeah, major, major influence um, in terms of like just kind of the philosophy behind attuning your own energy. Uh, to be able to treat people and letting that kind of radiate outwards as opposed to thinking about going and treating each individual patient. Um, I'm not sure I'm doing quite justice with my words here, but that that centeredness of, you know, people come into your, you know, clinic and, and they're on your wavelength rather than like getting onto each individual person's wavelength. That seems to be one of the secrets to how some of these, particularly in his style, uh, practitioners are treating, you know, hundreds of people a day and not burning out. Um, and so that that had a big impact. And then just the standards of practice, you know, like rolling rice grain moxas and, um, you know, putting them on a tissue paper without burning the tissue paper to have it just the right temperature. Um, you know, something on fire, okay, it's not gonna burn paper. Yeah, that's, that's a different type of level of skill that I would have had without that experience, I think. Yeah, that's amazing. Is there a process that you go through at the beginning of your work day to uh, center yourself and attune yourself? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's either that chanting, you know, or for, or for me as a person. And yes, for you personally. Oh, totally. Yeah, it, it, it's varied over the years, um, but it usually has some element of, you know, chanting or like kind of like some sort of scriptural reminder Mm -hmm. you know, uh, of me and kind of like grounding and connecting myself to some sort of spiritual uh, practice. It has some elements of stillness. It has some elements of like really kind of taking care of my body, uh, especially. And again, that changes based on what I'm needing, depending on the season, depending on the phase of life. Um, and then usually if I if I can manage the time, uh, it's it's also like whatever I'm working on at that time that I want a few more reps in. That could be martial arts. That could be uh, you know, some sort of other physical quality uh, that could be meditation as a, you know, general uh, subject. Yeah. Awesome. So you mentioned the spiritual component there. And of course, you've trained, you know, in uh, Taoist martial arts, for lack of a better term. Is that Taoism a part of your daily life? Is the philosophy of Taoism something? Yeah, that you... totally. Like I have an altar um, that, that I do some practices at. And, and I think like, the philosophy behind some of the arts is something that I try to keep in mind, whether it's whether I'm sitting with Taoist, Taoist martial arts and practicing or even taking it on a different lens and looking at Western exercises, um, because I think that's that, that's a, a large, you know, a large bar bulk of what I've done in the past several years, you know, and I say several meaning like, you know, getting closer to like five to ten. Uh, more on the 10 side now, but like it has really been pouring time into that. And so understanding these sort of ideas um, of yin and yang, five elements, uh, and also some of the structural ideas and, and individual kind of com relationships between the physical body, energetic body. These are things that, yeah, I, I set up reminders purposefully um, throughout my practice, throughout my day so that I can, I can keep track of these things. And so that I continue to like a planting a seed in the ground. Like yeah. if you water it, it'll grow. If you just leave it, 
you know, it may or may not grow. Um, and so that's what I try to do with, with some of the practices. And, and sometimes it feels, you know, like I'm all over the place. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a good groove. It's, it's, um, you know, self-practice definitely goes through some phases, but I always maintain it because it's something that I really feel strongly that I want to grow. Yeah. What's your martial arts practice like these days? Is it a big part of your everyday life? Yeah. I mean, so it, it, the, it ranges. So this past year, uh, two of the biggest influences were I was studying uh, Spear with Master Joe. Yeah. Um, and then I was studying the Chunyang Babu, uh, Bagua with Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Wei, who you've had oh. on the podcast. So yeah. those were, those were two of my main focuses. And then recently, because we had a baby, uh, two plus months ago yeah congratulations. it's been more getting okay. thank you i appreciate that and it's been more getting back into uh like reviewing quite a bit and making sure that things feel strong feel flexible taking care of my body a little bit because I, what i've found is that with sleep deprivation that i'm i'm not quite able to train as train and recover quite as fast as yeah. without that so yeah. i've had to be a little bit mindful and focus a little bit more on the restorative side of things and yeah, and I'm, I've really been also focused on pulling out individual parts that I've been trying to use for more of a therapeutic approach um, with patients and things like that. So really examining um, certain skills and certain movements that feel representative of maybe a principle that I'm trying to you know teach in a course or something like that. I have a you know a Taiji class here that runs a few times a week, and I have some you know some dedicated students and some folks that drop in, and, and you know that's really appreciated and. Um, I enjoy teaching the group. Uh, it's a nice, strong group on the mountain here. Um, but, you know, as far as my own, own practice, it's been recently more exploration than it has. Um, I'd like to get back to more like formal with a teacher sort of training, but it's been more exp exploration in the past month. Yeah, th those can be helpful stages to go through, I've found. Um, do you ever prescribe Qigong or Tai Chi to your patients as a part of their recovery process treatment? Yeah, totally. Um, Totally, totally. Whether it's to like repattern their movement to help them to kind of just like influence the general direction of chi and blood circulation within their body. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> would you like some example? Yeah, I mean, yeah, please, like please. A, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear a couple of success stories if you, you know, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, man, like there's, there's different ways of kind of looking at certain things so i'll often like take a movement and i'll break it down from a couple different angles so for example like low back pain yeah. there's a million different reasons why people have low back pain so it's trying to figure out which elements are involved so okay we can do some motion testing to figure out is there is it more from a rotational aspect is it because there's a poor foundation you know the pelvis which would include our idea of the dantian is not uh is not aligned correctly and so everything branching up the spine is is not able to flow correctly. And so we have pain because there's there's energy and circulation trying to go through an area that's too small or it's it's not aligned correctly. And so we, we experience pain as a result that chi flow is blocked. Um, or, you know, is it flexion or extension, you know, like Ren and Dumai or something like that involved? So figuring out which one is involved and then choosing elements of, okay, like, for example, a lot of people have what's well, the one thing that's really common right now in physical therapy as far as dealing with most kind of issues, um, but especially regarding the core and low back is rib flare. So the yeah. ribs kind of rising up and out in front of the, um, the torso and we can't really exhale if our ribs are up there. So in Chinese medicine, we look at that as sort of a physical manifestation of liver chi stagnation because that's the area of the body ruled by the liver and the wood element. You know, the meridians run through there, the physical organs is there, and it also matches like our ability, like, you know, the diaphragm is getting physically stuck there. And so, you know, within even just a wuji posture, sometimes it's all that's needed for a patient to really help to relax through that area. I mean, Santi, you know, uh, is, is the same thing. That was one, the first correction I, I saw Master Joe make with a student when I walked into the first Xing Yi class was like, you know, he was just coaching them to, okay, like draw down the front to some extent to really open up the back and the Duma. Yeah. You know, not we're not kephotic. We're not walking around like right. we're 75 here, but like right. we're, we're closing that area because if it's always overextended, we have limited range. We're, we're like, we're a bow that's like already taught before we even stretch the bow to put the arrow in. 
right. it's more likely to break or experience strain. Um, so I, I'll do a combination of, of that and also in, include some, you know, perhaps more physical exercises, uh, you know, where we're kind of like using muscles to control that area. Uh, maybe that's on the floor, maybe that's in a crawl position, uh, but it's the same principle. It's the exact same principle as being able to do it with, with muscle and like, you know, kind of a hard style and being able to do it in a soft way. And for right. me, that's the yin and yang of being able to treat something with, with movement. So one question that I've been trying to ask everybody, and I think you might have answered it either fully or in part earlier, is what do you see as the role of uh, these arts moving forward? Taoist arts or internal arts, TCM? What do you think their place is in the modern world? I know I mean, it's a, it's a question. great question. Yeah, it's a great, it's a broad question, but it's a great question to ask. And I think like that's something that as practitioners, Maybe not at the beginning, you know, like you get into it, you know, you just want to learn more. You just want to study more. You know, that's great. And I think that's a great um, path. But especially as we start to teach and we start to think about giving it back and like, you know, all of a sudden I realize, hey, like people are looking to me as like holding this skill from a particular teacher. Yeah. And OK, like I think our first responsibility is to try to understand them and try to understand what our teachers think is important and, and really understand like what to preserve. Because, you know, sometimes I think these arts get really watered down when somebody who doesn't have a full grasp of what's going on within a system, um, whether it be martial, energetic, medicinal, starts to say, oh, this is actually, we're just going to like do Tai Chi for fitness. And, and, you know, mm -hmm. like, this is how we do it. And we just, we just drop our shoulders and that's the whole, you know, class. Yeah. Um, Whereas like there's, you know, and, and I found this, Master Joe's one the teacher that I've studied with, with for the longest, um, you know, and there were often times when he would make a comment about a particular aspect of practice or like where, you know, Jing Qi and Shun are, for example, in a Taiji form. Like, how do I manifest that? And I, I just didn't, you know, it was something that I didn't realize was important. And then I practiced that, played with it, confirmed, yes, you know, for me, I felt that it was important. Okay, I want to preserve that. So I think the first step is to preserve what's essential that makes these things what they are. Um, and then the second step is as we start to adapt it to a modern society, because your question almost has two parts. You know, we have the internal, you know, slash Taoist arts, and we have the modern Western world. And the second part is figure out exactly what part we want to develop and give back. You know, there are some teachers um, who like their their gift is like, and, and I've had some of these, their gift has been, hey, I could take some of these traditional movements and either I was taught them in a martial setting or I'm going to revert them to understanding them in a, in a very physical modern setting. And I want to make sure that people know that Chinese martial arts are, re for, are for real. Yeah. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I've realized in my practice, sometimes I, I, I wish that I had that like full, you know, like uh, kind of banging around in a, you know, in a dojo sort of experience. But I realized that I don't really like, I don't embody that the full aspects. I still continue to learn from teachers who do, and I want to continue to understand them more. But for me, my area of what I can give back because of the people that I work with in the field that I'm in is more medicinal. Yeah. It's parsing out, okay, how do these things actually help our health? How do we understand if somebody doesn't want to do these practices, how do we still say, hey, these are these are essential parts of your health that they offer you and you got to go get them somewhere else if you don't get them here uh, or else you're going to keep struggling with the problems you're struggling with. Or if they're in you know, a class or, or they're willing to engage with these arts, hey, this is not it's never one to one. And I think understanding like that, you know, when we prescribe exercises from a particular Qigong or, or internal art set is helpful to remember. But these movements tend are thought to benefit this aspect of health. You know, this twisting is is going to wring out some of that like static blood within the liver. This like like you know dropping of the tailbone is going to open up the physical space around the kid. Like these things and helping people to really understand them because the Western world loves explanations. It loves to know why the thing is before they even try it. And you know you're not going to learn it traditionally that way, but it, it's nice to be able to talk their language sometimes. To, to help folks to really 
I spent a lot of my career like, I don't care about that. And I've realized, you know what, like if I really want to to make the impact that I want to have, I, I want to speak the language a little bit so that I can I can speak to more a wider audience and help a wider audience of people. And yeah. so that's one thing for me is like being able to understand and really, really like in multiple languages almost uh, be able to pass these things. Yeah, it's a great outlook because there's a wide variety of people out there and not everybody responds to everything. So you, you do have to kind of learn to speak in a lot of different languages, so to speak. Totally. Yeah. So uh, what have you got going on right now? Would you like to talk about your practice a little bit there in uh, San Juan, Costa Rica? Yeah, San Jose, <laughs> but close. <laughs> San Jose, yeah. Um, San Juan's Puerto yeah, Rico, yeah, right? We're in the Central Valley. So um, I I think mainly I'm I'm focusing on a couple different things. I still maintain, you know, a small in-person practice, but the main thing I've been focusing on is online education towards, again, bridging that gap between acupuncturists who want to understand movement from our medicine's lens and movers who want to understand like a Chinese medicine perspective, especially on movement, but also like a little dabble in the medicine a little bit as well. And especially understand that common language that really helps us to understand, hey, like, we can start to look at movement from a five element angle. We can start to understand yin and yang imbalance and disharmony, both in a physical sense for, you know, everyone can understand that. That doesn't need to be just acupuncturists. And also within movement, within training, if you want to be like a fitness person, like understanding what these things actually are, what's the difference between, you know, when we talk about fitness, you know, what are we fit for right. in the Western world? Like, are we fit for, you know, it, it, it ends up being like, we're fit to look good for somebody else. It's like, that's what people go for within that industry more often than not. And I think that really contrasts with like this traditional Chinese medicine view on Yangsheng, like life promoting, life nourishing practices. Like right. what are we actually, how are we actually nourishing ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis and parsing out like which aspects of, you know, physical activity and exercise, martial arts really like nourish us and how do they do it? And so that's really the the main focus is I've been putting together education uh, more recently. And um, it, that'll eventually lead to whether it's me or also bringing in some teachers. Um, I'm down here in Costa Rica. So we have, you know, beautiful land, beautiful trees, beautiful uh, um, wildlife. And so if, you know, me and my wife are both acupuncturists and so trying to bring some people down here um, and start to, you know, hey, you want to learn something I have to teach or you just want to come down and you know, take a break and be able to actually restore. Um, so we're, we're, we're preparing for some opportunities like that. Oh, sounds awesome. Where can people find you at? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I keep most, most of my social media is updated through way underscore of underscore Sam. Um, my website, wayofsam.com or blue north acupuncture.com are both good ways to, to stay in the loop. Uh, and then also like, you know, I, I don't know if you have show notes, uh, on YouTube or something like that. You can, I'll drop my email in there. Like yeah, people we'll, can contact me directly. That may be the easiest way sometimes. Yeah. We'll put a link in the description with all your information for sure. Yeah. I'd be happy to hear, um, you know, from anybody who's interested in, in anything I'm having to, we, we had, uh, pop up on our discussion today. Okay. Well, it was great talking to you, Sam. Hopefully we can do it again sometime in the future. If you ever want to come back and discuss anything specific, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, awesome. Thanks for talking to me today. Have a good one. Yeah. Thanks, Bill.